Right now, gold is nearly double its 1980 nominal high of $850. Silver, on the other hand, is still 30% below its 1980 nominal high of close to $50. Can anybody name me anything that is cheaper now than it was in 1980? We all know that $50 in 2012 does not buy you anywhere near what it did in 1980. If we factor that record 1980 price of $50 in silver using the government's rigged inflation numbers, that means we would have a real inflation-adjusted high of silver at $130. That would mean that we're still 75% below the real inflation-adjusted high of silver back in 1980. If we use that same inflation calculator for gold, we would see the real high for gold is $2,300. This means that we're still 25% below that record in real terms. I believe the real, real high of silver and gold is much, much higher than that for many reasons. First, the government is lying to you about the real rate of inflation. A recent CNBC article shows that the government is lying to you, even today, about the real rate of inflation. They do this so they can steal from you, plain and simple. Every dollar that they print is a direct tax against your wages and savings. They need to keep your expectations low so that you will not panic while they are gutting you. The government hides this inflation of the currency through four major tricks. Number one is hedonic adjustments. If a car goes up in price, say from $20,000 to $21,000, it would, on the face of it, show a 5% increase in the price. The government does not want that, so it creates an adjustment which takes into account the value of the options added. They arbitrarily create a dollar figure of value of, say, a better standard radio, better tires, lumbar support, upgraded cloth seats, and a dual exhaust. The government can say that that added $1,500 worth of value to that car. So when calculating for inflation, the price of the car went down 2.5% to $19,500. It does not matter if you don't want, need, or even value those options. The price goes up for you and down for the government. A trick corporations use is to say a 12 ounce can of soda is a dollar and through smaller cans they are now 10 ounces and still charge you a dollar. You lose 17% of your soda which costs more per ounce. The government says it's still a can of soda and it's the same price so no inflation. Presto. The second trick they use is substitution. If inflation cannot be tamed through hedonics they simply substitute a product in the basket with a less expensive product. Say the original basket of goods had filet mignon in it and it went up from $9 to $10 a pound. They can simply substitute it with porterhouse steak at, say, $6 a pound, and actually say that inflation went down to eat meat. They can then substitute that with ground beef, chicken, pork, or even dog food. The very fact that people would substitute a higher product for a lesser one because of cost is clear evidence of inflation, and yet they use it to understate it. If housing remains too expensive, they use rental rates. Remember, it's all about containing your expectations. The third trick they use is weighting. When that does not work, the government changes the weighting of a hotter category with a lesser one. For example, healthcare and education are notorious for rising costs. They make up 20% of the economy. And for the CPI, the government might only weigh it as 15%, lessening the effect of the overall number. Or they might weigh certain regions of the country more than others. Or they might weigh discretionary consumables that are known to be falling in price, that we buy infrequently, and that are not vital to the necessities that we need and buy every day. The fourth trick is, when all else fails, they just don't count it at all. Left out of all these real inflation equations for the government are the most essential parts of our lives. Food, energy, and taxes. I don't know about you, but these three things are the things that I care about most in my budget. In addition to these internal tools, the government can export inflation by sending money overseas so it never hits our economy. Also, if money can be pushed into stocks, it does not enter the real economy, and that also benefits the elite, especially when there is an orchestrated fleecing of the public through crashes. So there were the four tricks that the government uses to lower our expectations on inflation. They use hedonic adjustments, substitution, weighting, and subtraction. This allows the government to post benign inflation of 2.4% when the real rate is easily over 10%. So if the real rate of inflation is four times higher than the official CPI number of silver and gold, that would put the real high of silver at $528 and gold at $9,220. This is a much more realistic number because the money supply in the United States has been vastly increased since 1980. Using the broad component of M2, there is approximately 10 times the amount of money in the economy. So if silver was at close to $50, in 1980 times, 
10 times more dollars in circulation would mean that silver is close to $500 and gold should be close to $8,500. With those numbers in mind, we are still miles away of hitting any real record in gold and silver. And this is just one factor in the price of silver. When you realize that there is a lot less silver in the world since 1980, $500 is too low. When you realize that there are 50% more people in the world since 1980, $500 silver is too low. When you realize that only about 15% of the world's population even had the opportunity to participate in the bull run of the 70s and 80s, $500 silver is too low. When you realize that there are a lot more dollars, euros, yen, yuan, and other currencies of the world since 1980, $500 silver is too low. When you realize that we are going to have a mathematically inevitable collapse of all fiat currencies, all paper assets like stocks, bonds, and real estate, silver is actually priceless.